I want to encourage you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. We're going to look at the life of Judas Iscariot today. Matthew chapter 27, and we'll begin reading in the very first verse. Uh, Really a culmination of this man's life. It says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. When they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, speaking of Jesus, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself, the Bible says. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury, because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. The very mention of the name Judas Iscariot, I'm sure when I introduced this uh, subject a moment ago, brings a lot of negative connotations, a lot of negative feelings. His name is synonymous with betrayal and with hypocrisy and with greed, and in some cases, the name of Judas Iscariot is associated with the devil himself. Still, there are some things about his life that we can learn and take heed to. If nothing else, it's a warning to those of us who would take our faith lightly, or those who are lost, who would crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For anyone intending to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ, I should tell you right now, there's some very high stakes involved in that. If you're going to claim to be a Christian or make Christianity a pursuit in your life, you have to realize it's not a trivial matter. It's something that we're really really going to have to think through. And this not only involves our testimony before a lost world, we need to be sure that we, unlike Judas, are not deceiving ourselves about our faith and our standing before God, even while we're going through all the motions together. So let's jump right in. I'm going to preach a message I've entitled, Betraying Innocent Blood. That is exactly what Judas did. Betraying Innocent Blood. And I want you to see, first of all, the man Judas symbolizes. If you watch some of the movies depicting the life of Christ and allow your imagination to wander when it comes to those portions where they produce a character to identify the role of Judas Iscariot, you might get a different picture of him than what I believe is actually accurate. Uh, some of these Hollywood descriptions portray him as some kind of a monster or as some man that's uh, possessed with demons and wild-eyed and uh, devious to the very core. But we need to remember this about Judas. He was a man, just like any other man. And I'm sure uh, there are some normal things about his life, things that we could identify with. We are not told anything about his life prior to his call to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. But that's true of other apostles as well. We are given very little background about where they came from or what their upbringing was like. In all probability, Judas had a somewhat normal birth. I'm sure he had loving and caring parents that sought to point him in the right direction. Uh, Perhaps they had high aspirations for his life. Perhaps they... They thought that something good would become of his life, and they were waiting in anticipation to see how he would turn out and what he would do and what cause uh, he would delve into in his life. His name Judas is a Greek rendition of the Hebrew Judah. And the name Judah means praise. We're not told, but perhaps his parents, upon seeing the birth of their son, were filled with gratitude and overwhelmed with joy and wanted to express their praise and appreciation to God, and they named their son Judah for that reason. I don't know. Whatever else we can conclude about his life, we need to remember this. Jesus chose Judas to be one of his followers, one of the original 12 apostles. When first chosen by the Lord, I don't believe that Judas was being controlled by demons and was part of some underlying scheme, and and that Jesus chose him to be an apostle knowing that he was going to be acting under the operation of the devil and bent on destroying Jesus. Even Satan, in his original state, was created, as you recall, to 
to be the chief musician, to bring praise and worship to God. So if you think that Jesus chose Judas, knowing that he was being controlled and influenced by the devil and was going to wreak havoc on his ministry, then you're going to have to take that up with the Lord. And you're going to to have to struggle with some other theological problems with that as well. But I think Judas was just like any normal human being, much like each of us. The problem was he yielded to temptation and eventually uh, betrayed the Lord he was purporting to serve. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, doesn't the Bible say that Jesus, Judas was a devil? Well, that's true. It, the reference would be John chapter 6, verse number 70, refers to the fact that Judas is called a devil in that verse. But isn't that true of all lost people? Are not all lost people children of the devil? Jesus said to the Pharisees that they were of their father, the devil. Does that mean they were the legitimate, um, practical sons of the devil? No, it means that they were operating in the devil's behalf. When Elimus the sorcerer sought to oppose the cause of Christ, Paul on this occasion said to him, Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? We find that in Acts chapter 13, verse 10. In fact, Jesus addressed Peter, who was obviously a saved, committed believer on one occasion. And he said, but he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me. And he referred to Peter as Satan. Well, was Peter uh, a reincarnation of the devil? No, he meant that in that particular moment, Peter was speaking on behalf of the devil. The mission of Christ before the foundation of the world was to come and to give his life and die for the sins of mankind. And anything or anybody who would interrupt that plan laid out by God before the foundation of the world was in effect serving the devil. I think that we are predisposed to think negatively of Judas because we know how he ultimately betrayed the Lord and what a key role he had in probably the greatest act of betrayal ever recorded in the history of the world. And so we we have this mindset against Judas in that regard. But Judas is symbolized in each of our lives. And But for the grace of God, we could all be a Judas Iscariot. We could all betray the Lord in one way or another. Still, we might wonder why Jesus, with all of his knowledge about human potential and all of the insight into the depravity of man, would purposely choose Judas, of all people, to be one of his 12 followers. We're going to have to deal with that in each in our own way, I suppose. But we need to remember this. Judas had choices to make in his life, including this choice. When Jesus called him to be a follower, Judas could have said no. Many, many more who were called by Jesus to follow him walked away, many of them sorrowful and did not follow him at all. We are never told when or where Judas first met Christ, but at some point they had an interaction and Judas made the choice willfully to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, I, I don't think his motives were completely pure, and, and no, nor do I. But were the motives of James and John pure when they asked their mother to go to Jesus and ask that they might have places and positions of privilege when he came into his kingdom? No, their motives weren't exactly pure in that situation either. I would like to think that Jesus knew of Judas's character flaws, also knew about his potential, and wanted to give him every opportunity to repent of his sinful ways and trust him by faith and receive eternal life. Jesus did the same for me, and he did the same for you, and he does the same for all who would come to him in faith. So the man Judas symbolized perhaps is me and perhaps is you. But I want you to notice, secondly, the miracles Judas saw. As I mentioned earlier, Judas had the privilege of traveling with Jesus for a period of about three years, and he was with them pretty much everywhere he went. Think of all that Judas heard and witnessed in that three-year period. Judas was there the day that Jesus fed 5,000 people with a handful of loaves and fish. In fact, Judas not only saw that, but Judas himself participated in that miracle. And he did the same thing a short while later, feeding 4,000 people. He saw Jesus calming the storm. He witnessed the blind receiving their sight and the lame walking again. He was there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Wow, what a remarkable event that would have been 
Judas was there, and he saw that. He saw Jesus raise somebody from the dead. He heard the wonderful Sermon on the Mount, and he was privy to the many settings where Jesus uh, spoke the parables and later took his disciples aside and explained the meaning of those parables to the disciples. He also heard the many warnings issued to the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders about pretending to have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. He heard those warnings himself. I wonder if he thought about his own life. He heard the parable of the prodigal son and maybe identified with the figures in that story. He saw Jesus walk on water and he saw him cast out demons. Listen to what we read about Judas in Luke chapter 9 in the first couple of verses. Then he, Jesus, called the twelve apostles, the twelve disciples together. Now, obviously, there's no doubting the fact that Judas was included in those twelve. He had not betrayed the Lord yet, and his replacement did not come to the book of Acts. So Judas was there when Jesus called this special setting together. And he gave them authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Later in verse 6, we read these words. Again, about the twelve apostles, including Judas. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So if you were to examine a resume of Judas Iscariot, you would be very impressed with what he was able to do. He was handpicked by Jesus, the Bible said. He was given specialized training and instruction and personally discipled by the Lord. He was commissioned by Jesus to go out. He had authority over demons. He could cure diseases and heal the sick. And he even went out through several towns and villages preaching the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. He was a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He not only witnessed the miracles of Christ, but he was able to not only see them firsthand, but to involve himself in these miracles. Don't you find that remarkable? He was able to do so much and yet was still lost and would betray the Lord. We find many today who would admit that Judas was a lost man. Uh, they would admit that he's in hell today. Yet Jesus allowed him to work miracles through this imparted authority that he gave to him. Many people are quick to equate signs and wonders and miracles with spirituality. They, if they hear of or uh, learn of people who are able to perform some kinds of miracles, and there's, there's a, that's a whole other story, they're quick to assume that those people must be acting on God's behalf and uh, be spiritual people. Well, maybe they ought to pause and consider the example of Judas Iscariot himself. Maybe they should remember uh, Pharaoh's wise men who were able to replicate the miracles of Moses. Maybe they should look at the story in the book of Acts of Elimus the sorcerer. And maybe they should remember that Satan himself is able to transform himself into an angel of light. You know, the working of miracles is not in and of itself evidence of spirituality or even of the new birth. But think of the advantage that Judas had over the other believers of his day. He was an apostle, handpicked. What makes his fall all the more tragic is the fact that he was able to do great things for the Lord. He had a great future in store. He was immersed in the gospel and spent personal time with Jesus Christ Yet he failed miserably because he was never a true believer. You say, what was his problem? What, what would cause someone who was given all these opportunities to betray the Lord? I think the answer is a simple one, and it's also my third point. I want you to notice the money Judas stole. The money Judas stole. We've already established the fact that Judas was a lot like you and I. He was given tremendous opportunities and potential to serve the Lord. He was a miracle worker. He was on his way to becoming a hero of the faith, like we read about, like Peter and John and Paul. Uh, Judas could have fit in that same category of people we greatly respect and admire and emulate today. We may never know exactly when, what went on in the mind and heart of Judas Iscariot, but we do know some, th some things about his life that will help us to put all this in perspective. And he appears to be a victim of a common malady, one that's existed before Judas's day, and unfortunately it's still around today. It's the love of money. It's referred to in 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Judas loved money, plain and simple. 
He loved money more than he loved the Lord Jesus Christ and more than he loved the other disciples and more than he loved lost mankind. On one occasion, Jesus was visiting his close friends, Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus in the city of called Bethany. And while they were there, they were sharing some fellowship and time together. And, and while a meal was being prepared there, the Bible tells us that Mary took a very expensive container of perfume and poured it on the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and wiped her feet with her hair. What an act of love and devotion. Most of you are familiar with that great story in the Bible. But somebody was there that day that didn't appreciate what she was doing, this act of devotion. It was Judas, of course. And he spoke up and he said, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now, none of us can deny the validity of taking concern with people who are poor. None of us would object to someone doing whatever they wanted to do to help relieve uh, the problems and the plight of the poor today. But that was not Judas's motive. It was really not the poor. In fact, John 12, 6 says this. This he, Judas, said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. In other words, he carried the financial assets, as meager as they may have been during the Lord's earthly ministry, didn't even have a place to lay his head. He carried the money that was used to prepare for their provisions and their food and their housing. And he, the Bible says quite clearly, stole money out of the bag that was set aside for the needs of Jesus and the disciples. Judas should have been happy for Mary. He should have looked at her act of devotion and, and concluded that it was her perfume to use any way she wanted anyway. If she wanted to, to, this, to, to engage in this act of devotion on the Lord Jesus Christ, he should have been happy for her and uh, envious that he didn't have the opportunity to do the same thing himself. Except Judas wanted the money and wanted any way that he could get it, get his hands on it, he wanted to get the money. He was a greedy, covetous man. Flip ahead to chapter 26 of Matthew, we'll find Judas selling out the Lord Jesus Christ for a petty 30 pieces of silver. Always the money. Always the money for him, wasn't it? Which is the root of all evil. When Judas first signed on to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, there was a lot of talk about an earthly kingdom. Perhaps Judas imagined himself to rise up in the ranks of the apostleship and, and be given a position of, of influence and therefore of wealth and to one day acquire a lot of money and be self-supported. But the disciples confused Jesus' mission. He didn't speak of an earthly kingdom. He spoke of a heavenly one. And when Jesus, Judas heard Jesus talk about all this, talk about him being killed, delivered up and killed, and them being scattered, perhaps he got disillusioned with this, this apostleship and this role as an apostle. We still have our Judases around today, of course. People will even... Uh, attend churches, Bible pre preaching churches like ours for the thought of advancing themselves monetarily or financially. And after they have taken advantage of the flock or found out that the opportunities were not what they thought they would be, they soon get discouraged and move on to do something else with their lives. They're like the rich young ruler who walk away disappointed that their financial goals conflicted with their spirituality. The man Judas symbolized is you or I. The miracles Judas saw were phenomenal. In fact, he not only saw them, he engaged in them. The money Judas stole had a bearing and factor upon his ultimate betrayal. But I want you to see finally the mercy Judas spurned. This is the most tragic point of all. There's nothing innately wrong with being rich or having a lot of money. But if that money or anything else for that matter in our lives causes us to be distracted from the call of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, then we are losers indeed. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus laid down the terms of discipleship. He said this, if you really want to be my disciple, here's what's, here's what's involved in that. I just want you to know ahead of time, it involves denying yourself, taking up your cross, and truly following me. Naturally, there are those for whom that decision was a difficult one, because many didn't take Jesus up on his offer to be a true follower, and they left. There were other things pressing in on their lives, and they weren't willing to make the commitments to be a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But to put it in perspective, Jesus told them why they were doing what he was asking them to do. He said this, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? That's an interesting, very convicting question. By the way, the answer to that is absolutely nothing. There's nothing you or I may acquire or gain from this life that can compare to the value of our soul. If you want a quick and easy way to determine whether something is worthwhile or not, ask yourself this. Will I be taking that thing with me to heaven? If I'm not taking it with me, then it's probably not that important. There are some things, of course, we can take with us to heaven. We can take our souls to heaven. We can take the souls of other ones. We can take our loved ones. Um, we can take our rewards with us to heaven, but we can't take any of our material possessions. And Judas, although he may have started out like any other normal person like you and I, somehow missed that lesson somewhere along the, the way in his service to the Lord Jesus Christ. He would later say, I have sinned and then I have betrayed innocent blood. It was too late for him at that point. Uh, most of you know he took his own life. The grief and heartache was so great that he took his own life and tossed aside the reward he got for betraying the Lord. I want you to know that Judas didn't die and go to hell because the Lord didn't make every effort for him to come to find Jesus as his personal Savior. At any point in this whole setting, Judas could have come to himself and realized that what he was doing was wrong. He could have confided in Jesus, not that the Lord didn't know, but he could have come and admitted and confessed to the Lord. He could have said, you know what, I just want you to know, Jesus, I have been stealing money from the money bag. I've been covetous and greedy, and uh, I just, I'm so sorry, and I want to apologize, and I want to I want to cling to you as my personal Savior. I recognize you now for who you are. You're not just a stepping stone in my financial career. You are the very God-sent Son of God to deliver me from my sins. He could have done that at any stage. His thievery was not exactly a, a, a great secret. All of the Gospel writers wrote about the character of Judas. They know who he was. And if they knew, it is most certain that Jesus knew that Judas had been stealing money from the money bag and that his heart was corrupt when Jesus talked about uh, the betrayal at the Last Supper with his disciples he basically gave Judas the opportunity and and single-handedly pointed him out and said whatever you're gonna do go do it now I know you're bent on betraying me I know that 30 pieces of silver is so important to you go ahead and do what you're going to do but prior to that Jesus gave Judas every opportunity to find eternal life he allowed him the, 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 the privilege of hearing him preach and to see him heal the sick and restore sight to the blind. He was there when Jesus raised people from the dead. He heard his sermons and, and received that specialized discipleship and training. Judas had every opportunity to be saved, but squandered it all. What a, what a valuable lesson to each of us. Now, for those of us who are saved, we should ask ourselves, Am I allowing my material interest or, or covetousness to interrupt my service and my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Because we brought nothing into this world and it is most certain we shall take nothing with us. You know, Is that crowding out our heart for the Lord and for His work and His service? Are we willing to, to accept the claims of discipleship? Are we truly willing to deny ourselves and to take up our cross, suffer if need be, and to truly follow the Lord? Judas's life is a tragic loss, a wasted opportunity, and we can all benefit from learning from it. Certainly for those who have never trusted Christ as their Savior, the life of Judas, who had all these opportunities, a man that preached the gospel and was given the authority to perform miracles and still betrayed the Lord and split hell wide open when he died, uh, his life should stand as a warning to the lost. That being religious or even being a preacher in, his, in itself not enough to go to heaven. One must have a genuine, bona fide, true relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you're not sure you're saved today, I would encourage you to learn from Judas' example and his mistakes and call out in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together, shall we? 
Dear Lord, we thank you for including these details in your word about a man who not only failed, but he failed miserably. And you spared us none of the details. We, we learned about his great opportunities. We saw how you commissioned him and you handpicked him to serve you. We read of how he was able to perform miracles and went to these various towns and villages preaching the gospel. It could well be. It is likely that there were those who heard the message and responded and were genuinely converted and saved from their sins due to the preaching of Judas Iscariot. Yet he himself was as lost as lost could be. Help us to learn some valuable lessons from his tragic mistakes and to evaluate our standing before you and to accept the terms of discipleship, realizing that one day we'll stand before you and we'll be rewarded for our faithful service. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us all aspire to be true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Have a great day.